hope that we can keep this schedule and that means the coffee break will be starting 10 minutes later and will be 10 minutes shorter so that we are back in time. And uh, to keep it short, I will just introduce you an old friend of mine, Nicolas Bredesch, is going to tell you about evolution in collective robotics. Okay, so thank you, thank you for the introduction. Um, I would like to first start by thanking the organizers. Uh, so far, it's a, it's a really great conference for me because I'm uh, not really from the fields which have been presented uh, so far, so I've learned a lot, and, uh, and uh, so thanks. Um, I'm going to, to discuss about uh, embodied evolution in collective robotics. So my, uh, my original field is computer science and I work in a, a laboratory which is in between um, biological modeling, uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. So it's, uh, it's a, a lab in uh, Sorbonne University which is in the center of Paris. So the, um, the basic idea of what I'm interested in is uh, illustrated in this uh, picture. So the basic idea is that we have this bunch of robots which are in a box. We want to put the box in uh, some environment we don't know and we want to release the robots and uh, want them to be able to uh, figure out what is to be done given that we have defined a loose objective, for example, gather some objects or explore the environment. And the, 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 the challenge is due to the fact that you don't know at first what uh, the environment looks like, what you must do to actually uh, complete the, uh, the task. So there are many things that you discover once you are already in the environment. Um, so, the, the, to define a little bit further the class of problem I'm interested in, it's uh, problems where there is a high level definition of the objective. For example, you uh, define that you want to uh, get your robots to forage uh, items in the environment, but you don't, uh, you're not capable of defining how they should do it. You don't define the behavior that they should do it. So, you have a very loosely defined metric that gives you an idea of uh, what, how good it is uh, performing, how good the swarm is performing, and how good it is performing compared to what it did previously. Um, I consider also robots which have, lim which have limited capabilities, that is, they have limited uh, communication, uh, meaning that they can't send that many messages, and uh, that they can only send these messages uh, in the neighborhood uh, of, uh, uh, in their neighborhood. <clears throat> and also, I uh, assume that these robots have limited computation power, so it's not possible to wait uh, to, uh, uh, for the whole robot to synchronize, uh, to make decisions. Really, this is a decentralized uh, uh, robotic setup. And uh, lastly, I consider open environments. That is, environment where you don't know a priori what the environment looks like, and there is no teacher uh, that is capable of helping you once the, the robots are deployed in the environment. So this is a quite specific uh, uh, um, uh, problem setting, of course, and what we've been doing for um, experimenting with this kind of problem, well, to, to do our test, to do our research, we mostly work in simulation, and also we work with several kinds of robots, of swarm robots, so these are examples of what I'm uh, doing. So uh, here you can see an image of uh, Timio robots extended with Raspberry Pi, which are working in the lab, uh, also of Kilobots, which is the second picture, which you have already seen in other presentation. And lastly, we also use uh, uh, micro beads, which are, mi which are micrometer beads, which we functionalized with uh, biomolecules so that they can send and receive message and they move just by uh, Brownian motion and stop by being attached to one another. So I won't really uh, discuss these robotic aspects in my presentation. I will show a little, uh, some video of robots, but uh, mostly it will be simulation because uh, in terms of methodology, what we do is once in a while we go to the real robots to be sure that we are not doing something which is out of the simulation, which is just out of focus with respect to the real problems we want to achieve, uh, to tackle. Uh, but also we do a lot of extensive uh, experiments to un really understand uh, the way the algorithms are working. <clears throat> so. Um, the thing is that when you uh, are in front of this kind of problem, there are not so many methods that you can use. It's a learning problem because you want to tackle a new, well, you want to, your swarm of robots to be able to 
acquire new behaviors that will be uh, defined by how the environment is. There is the strong uh, influence from the ecological aspects of where you are. So the goal is to design, uh, my goal is to design lifelong learning algorithm, lifelong because the environment may change through times, uh, for these swarm of robots, that means uh, in a decentralized uh, distributed system. So as I said, there are not many uh, methods that can be used in this context. Um, reinforcement learning for multi-agent system is quite limited. Usually you've got some nice theoretical results, but it cannot be implemented in the real world. Or when you implement things in the real world, these are very simplified uh, learning methods which have nothing to do with what is developed in, uh, in the theoretical framework. So there are pros and cons for, for this. One approach which is quite efficient, which is a good candidate, is evolutionary robotics. So uh, evolutionary robotics, um, combines, uh, well, apply evolutionary computation, evolutionary optimization for uh, optimizing the controllers of robots. So it has been introduced quite uh, some time ago in the 1990s by several people, including some people who are actually in this room. So I guess you will recognize yourself. And um, this is very efficient because it's a stochastic optimization method. That is, you don't have to know that much about the objective uh, to tackle, you have uh, to get a loose definition of the objective in terms of a fitness function. You can manipulate some uh, very exotic uh, representation where you can explore re uh, exotic representation space. So it can be parameters, but it can also be structure. Structure, sorry. And uh, um, it gives quite good results. It's some, it's, uh, these are meta-heuristics, so it gives, it gives approximate results. So this is quite fitted for um, swarm robotics and learning in swarm robotics, but yet it is not uh, really applied to online robotics. Uh, so just for those of you who don't know how it works, uh, really quickly, you start with an initial population of candidate solution, which can be parameters of a control model. Then you evaluate uh, these uh, candidate solutions in simulation or on the real robots. Then you can rank these different solutions in terms of the, of the performance uh, that the robot achieved with these parameters. And then you, oper you operate a selection and then variation over these solutions in order to select mostly the best of the solutions so far and uh, to build new solutions which are more or less uh, closely related to the previous uh, solution. And then you replace your population of candidate solution, and then you start again, and you iterate until you've exhausted your budget or you've reached a satisfactory uh, solution. So uh, the next step is uh, how to adapt this in a distributed uh, setup uh, for online learning. And this uh, is possible thanks to another framework, which is an extension, which is a, an instance of the uh, original evolutionary robotics framework, which is called embodied evolution. So it has been introduced uh, by uh, Richard Watson some less than 20 years ago, and it has been well developed quite a lot in the last 10 years. So the idea is that you still take this evolutionary computer, computation machinery, but you put it in one robot. And these robots, each robot will run an optimization algorithm, but then what you will do, what you will modify, is that you will add communication, you will take uh, uh, communication into account, and each robot will spread its own parameters, its own genome, to nearby robots uh, during, the, uh, during the different encounters. And after some time, the genomes that you have received, the parameters that you have received, you will run an evolutionary algorithm based on the uh, fitness values of these different received genomes, and then select a new genome to act as your active genome, that is to um, fit your controller with, uh, with some new parameters. So it looks like an island model where each of these little robots are running an algorithm and exchanging uh, material, exchanging uh, information so as to uh, increase performance over time. So this is not uh, anymore a stochastic optimization algorithm, even though evolutionary computation still, uh, still is, of course. But this becomes a distributed online uh, learning method because, uh, well, you are running online, you can, well, you don't care about reinitializing the position of the robots. You can really run it for a long time. You uh, have a distributed algorithm because each of these little islands are communicating with uh, one another, so it can take time for the whole population to converge one, uh, to, towards one particular solution, and, uh, and that's it. So the main difference with the classic evolutionary robotic setup is that in the classic evolutionary robotic setup, you you build a situation in the lab, you optimize under a specific condition, and then you obtain a solution which you then deploy in the real world. While here, what you do is that you deploy your robot, and then you let the algorithm learn new behaviors while it is already deployed. So you deploy, then, then learn. And that's, that makes things quite, uh, quite uh, different. 
Um, so I'm going to walk you across a vanilla version of the algorithm so that you really understand where the mechanics. So how do we control the robots? What we call a genome is just a set of parameters, like weights of a control function, which can be an artificial neural network or a linear combination of uh, sensory inputs. So this is the first box on the left, where you have a genome, so what we call a genome, which, is this, uh, which are specific values, in this example, for something which is then uh, going to be the controller. And how you, you can see here that these parameters are then used to uh, um, compute the motor value, the left and right motor value of this little robot, based on the sensor input, which are the infrared, so proximity sensors, of the robot. Here you've got four uh, proximity sensors, two motor outputs, and you combine these proximity sensors using these weights to get the motor outputs. At each time step, this is what you will do. And of course, if you change the parameter, then you will change the behavior of your robot. It's some kind of genotype to phenotype uh, mapping. And um, so the, the thing is that the algorithm, actually the evolutionary algorithm, runs once in a while. For a long time, we just let the robot go through time. They will act according to their uh, current active genome, which will be the parameters controlling the, uh, well, parameterizing the control function. They will move through the environment, possibly gather some item, items if it's a foraging task. And this is just one example among others. And then at the end, you will run the algorithm. So at each step, you have to see that whenever one robot encounters another, it will transmit its own genome information along with its fitness function, its performance, an assessment of its performance. And then at the end, you will run this algorithm, which uh, is very simple. First, you delete your current active genome. You lose the parameters of your control function. Then you select one uh, of the uh, other parameters which were received during your lifetime. Uh, possibly using the fitness values of the different genomes to, uh, to, to, to force a bias towards better performing uh, genomes. And then you will apply some variation. So typically it will be mutation, Gaussian mutation, over the parameters to get a slightly different uh, new genome to explore, in fact, the vicinity of uh, the original parameters. And then you will use this genome as a new active uh, genome to, 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 uh, to program your control function. And then you will start again. So um, this is very simple. The real algorithm we put in the robots are not that much uh, uh, complex. Actually, I had another slide which I removed where I, would, uh, I just showed you where the, uh, the algorithm, the real algorithm, is just like 10 to 15 lines. So very easy to implement, including in very uh, uh, um, low, um, powerful, in, in very simple uh, robots. So if we take this algorithm and let's see it, uh, another representation of the scenario of one lifetime, here you've got the three robots that we saw before. The number in the robots are the fitness function. The fitness function is actually the number of uh, the fitness value, sorry. And the fitness function is the number of items that you've gathered in the environment. And so this is the fitness value. And here you have the reservoir. So this is contained in each of the robots. Of course, it's not centralized. And here we're going to record the uh, other genome, the incoming genome, and the values uh, of the, the, the fitness value of each genome at the moment it was transmitted. So what you see is that your robots are moving around. They are gathering uh, items. And at some point, they will stop and they will do this. They will uh, execute the algorithm I showed you before. So actually, the blue robot here got one genome, the genome of robot red. And at this time, when they met, when they exchanged genetic material, the uh, fitness value of the red robot was one. The red one got two genomes from both robots with different fitness value. The green with uh, two, because, well, it got uh, two items and the blue, and the green one is similar to the blue one. It got only one genome of, um, from the, the, the red robot. And the interesting thing is, and what uh, actually the distributed aspect of the, uh, the framework uh, does, is that uh, there are several selection pressure. It's not as in evolutionary computation, classic evolutionary computation, when you are in zero, zero dimension. Here, you've got two selection pressure. One is coming from the fitness function, that is, the green robot is actually the best at foraging. And whenever it will spread its own genome, it will be for sure selected because it's better than any other one. But the red ro robot was uh, not better in terms of fitness function, but was better at spreading its own genome. So it's best in terms of mating. So here you can see that there are two selection pressure, one at the individual user-defined function, uh, fitness function level, another one, which 
which is just related to the uh, uh, way the robot will move in the environment and which is not covered by a fitness function that is written by uh, a user uh, a supervisor. So this uh, imposes some trade-off to be uh, explored and to be done, and this is some things that we've been uh, actually uh, uh, studying, of course, which I won't uh, tell in this presentation because, of, uh, uh, because I want to stick in 40 minutes. Um, so we did, this, we did several experiments with this, of course. So the first experiment we did was we put it in real robots. So here you have a, a swarm of 19 EPUX robots. So the EPUX robots are the one you see on the... Uh, here, there are quite simple robots with sensor proximity sensors here, um, bumpers also, and uh, here it's uh, extended EPUX actually that were uh, developed at the Bristol Robotics Laboratory where we could travel uh, some years ago. And um, we add something else also to these robots. We virtualize actually local communication. So this is this little circle shows the diameter, the, the, um, uh, the diameter of communication, the communication for these little robots here. So you can really see that it's local communication. And we also had another object, the white one here. It's not a robot, it's just a passive object. It's uh, not useful. If you get to this uh, object, you don't gain anything, no energy, no whatever, nothing. But everybody sees it. Everybody sees its orientation and distance to this uh, particular object, which we can call a landmark. And uh, so, in this particular case, uh, the thing is that because you have several kinds of uh, selection pressure, you can even remove the selection pressure which is uh, defined by the user-defined fun fitness function. So this is what we did in this experiment. There is no fitness function, no objective to be, uh, to be achieved. We are just studying the, uh, the selection pressure due to the environment. So if you look at the... So, it's a video with uh, 19 robots. It's accelerated, and what you can see is that this landmark here, at first, people, uh, robots are ignoring it, but after some time, they will gather uh, around this, uh, uh, this landmark. And after some time, actually, where well, they are pretty much around it, most of the population, and we will move it to another place just to check if they, have, uh, if they are, in fact, uh, interested by the position of the landmark. And the reason it does so is because when you've got a landmark, a meeting point, well, if you go to the meeting point, you will meet anyone else that is also at the meeting point. If you ignore the meeting point, then you will be anywhere in the environment. So your probability to meet some other robots is higher if you go towards one particular location which uh, everybody has spontaneously agreed on without any consensus. And once you're around this landmark, the thing is that if you meet, if there is a robot which is not uh, driven by the landmark, which doesn't care about the landmark, if it goes by chance just near the landmark, it will face a family of robots with very homogeneous uh, uh, genotypic signature while it will still be alone uh, uh, spreading its own genome. So the probability is that it will be invaded by these very homogeneous genomes which are overrepresented and his genome will disappear. Disappear. So it acts as, a, as an uh, attractor, actually. So actually, we did some other experiments, so this time in simulation. So we did it with several uh, number of robots. We vary the condition. We found actually the same results as with the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the real robots. Uh, of course, we do it with 4,000 robots because we don't have grants which are funded enough to buy 4,000 robots. That's unfortunate, but that's life. And uh, what, we, what we found is the similar, but what you can see here, so these are 4,000 robots, and we put several landmarks, actually, in the environment. So these are the same as the, the one you saw here. And the thing is that the robots are the same. They uh, perceive they have proximity sensors. They are driven by an artificial neural network which weights are evolved, so it's a quite a small uh, uh, um, list. And uh, they know the orientation and distance to the closest landmark, and this is where it's important. And what we see are three attractors, actually. The same as the, uh, in the video with the real robots here. There is aggregation around the, uh, the, the landmarks, but also we can see these robots, so uh, it's not dynamic, but what you see when you see the video is that there are some robots which have learned to just do for wall following. And this is very interesting because then the environment becomes one-dimensional. Just uh, going in this 
part and some others are going in the other direction, makes it very uh, easy actually to meet many, many other robots and uh, without any cost, just you have to, well, there is no cost, but you just have to follow the world to spread your own genome. So it's quite an efficient way. And the third one, which was actually surprising when I saw this uh, at first, is that you've got, you, you have these, so, some kind of Voronoi frontiers which are emerging too, which was actually unexpected. And these Voronoi frontiers are just uh, emerging because there are some robots which, uh, by chance at first, were fleeing from the landmarks. But the thing is that when you flee from several landmarks, you end up at the frontiers, and these frontiers also, also except from this little point here, also a one-dimensional uh, space in which, well, your family of genome will be very robust and uh, will meet with many other uh, robots uh, that have the same uh, genotypic signature. So um, the uh, interesting with this, uh, this thing is that we uh, studied quite a lot of things. We observed quite a lot of uh, dynamics, of uh, evolutionary dynamics leading to um, behaviors which were uh, uh, actually shaped by the environment. So um, in the next step, yeah, we, we also observed the interaction between this environmental selection pressure and uh, user-defined fitness function pressure. And actually, they are working once one against the other sometimes. And it's not really easy to balance between the two because if you want to favor the, the, the user-defined fitness function, you can have, end up with the, uh, breaking the algorithm just because, because you will keep it from uh, uh, um, favoring the encounter of other robots and then the algorithm will not work anymore. So what we also did was we studied task allocation. Um, so in this, uh, in this setup, um, we have uh, several robots. We have two kind of resources and um, we have to choose among the two resources, actually. So we studied this in two different kind of environment. A separate environment when you have two patches of resource, so the two patches are of different type, and another one, and they are moving through time also, and one other time where uh, the two patches are at the same position and this position will move over time. So here we call it the separate environments, the separate patches, actually, and this is uh, collocate patches, so we call it the collocate uh, environment. And in this setup, what we wanted to study was the ability for a whole population to uh, perform task allocation or specialization. That is, uh, we wanted to force that uh, one half of the population would go on one resource while the other half would go on the other resource. So it's a quite uh, classic uh, foraging setup with specialization, of course. So we have a fitness function which counts at each time step um, the, number of, uh, well, the, the number of energy, uh, the amount of energy that you, that you got. And to get, to compute this, well, you, have, uh, you rely on an additional gene which gives you your ability to synthesize energy for one particular resource. And we define this gene, so between minus one and one, but what is important with this gene, which, which we call uh, gene scale, is that um, depending on the value, you can only synthesize energy from the first resource or the, the other resource. You cannot have generalist. It's not possible. You must specialize. So the expected uh, result is that you should have uh, the population dividing in two subparts, two subpopulations, each specializing on one kind of, of a resource. At the individual le levels of foraging tasks are mutually exclusive, but at the population level, uh, each resource only gives enough energy for half of the population to survive. So you really want your population to be divided on, uh, upon the two resources. And uh, so what happens when, uh, so this is uh, an experiment with the uh, separate environment. You've got these two patches. They are moving through time. And if you, yeah, I think you see it on the screen. You see that the robots are moving and following the task. So they are both able to synthesize from the patch they are on and also to follow uh, the, the right patch. But the thing is that uh, it's quite different when you look at the environment where uh, resources are collocated. What you would expect is the same kind of thing, but it's not. So here, what you see is that here, so these are for the two, uh, um, uh, these are for the two environments. Um, this is the number of individuals which are alive. That is, they had enough energy to um, keep on going. And here, in this environment, you see that, okay, we're very close to the maximum. It's an experiment with 200 robots. There are 50 replicates. And uh, this is the value of the uh, gene scale, which you can see is actually specializing, and you really see it at the level of the population. So it's a head map of uh, the values uh, of the gene scales of the population. And you can see at the first, it's quite uh, random, of course. And then uh, you have uh, two, uh, two clusters uh, for each resource. While on the collocate environment, things are very different. 
you've got only half the population which is surviving, and actually when you look at this, the gene skill has only one value. It could be the other way, it depends on the run, of course, but the thing is that it cannot succeed, it, it completely fails at, uh, at uh, uh, specializing in this context. And the reason is due to the way we define our task. The, there is not a great benefit to uh, forage in the uh, resource which is the less foraged. And because we use uh, not a very big number of robots, like one, so in this experiment it's 200 robots, the thing is that if there is a disequilibrium at first in the initial population, then uh, there it will be very unlikely that we will reach a balance. It will become un more and more unbalanced, and there will be a bias in selection because of the small population, and we'll just end up with uh, one uh, uh, genotypic signature uh, in the population. And once it is done, the mutation operator is, uh, well, there is a very low probability to, uh, uh, to have a change because the invasion barrier is very high. We would need more than 50% of mutants arising at the same time to go to towards the other resource. So this, this is something that, um, that really is a problem with this algorithm. And actually, we did some numerical simulation and more uh, experimental simulation in, simula in uh, robotic simulation. And uh, what, uh, what is shown is that, actually, uh, there are several things that matter. So we tried several population size. We tried several densities. So this means that we have an abstract graph where the, the nodes are robots, are supposed to be abstract robots. And the, uh, the arcs between uh, nodes represent communication between the, uh, the agents. And in this case, what we can see is that when the population size augments, then we are able to retain, uh, uh, to retain the uh, uh, specialization uh, longer. The uh, second thing is that when the density is increasing, so when uh, you're going from a very sparse graph to a more dense graph, and not that dense actually, then uh, it becomes too difficult, so you cannot maintain specialization. So specialization occurs because of some kind of geographical separation. So here it's just sparsity, but in the uh, robotic simulation, actually, we, uh, we, we implement, we model geographical separation. And the last thing is that we also made some uh, experiments with uh, selection pressure applied uh, by uh, user-defined fitness function that capture, actually, the foraging, uh, well, the, the performance with respect to foraging. And uh, the more uh, selection pressure you, you, you put, you, the more artificial selection pressure you put, the, uh, the worse, actually, the, uh, the algorithm is, uh, is working. So it's an interesting result because it turns out that even if we want to help the algorithm by uh, expliciting what it should be done, that is foraging of resources, then it turns out to be counterintuitive uh, compared to letting just the environmental selection, which actually captures the fact that if you don't get energy, you will just stop moving and stop uh, executing the, uh, the, uh, the algorithm. So um, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is quite interesting, of course, at least we think it is. Um, we, uh, we know that embodied evolution is quite a good candidate for uh, doing swarm robotics uh, lifelong learning, but, and we have several results with respect to this, which I won't uh, have time to, to, um, to discuss. But uh, the thing is that we, there are some limits also. We are, because of the complexity of the environment, the interaction of the complexity of the interaction between the algorithm and the environment, it's quite difficult to uh, find solution to pinpoint what are the real problems of these algorithms. And we are more or less creating some uh, simulation, observing uh, at the phenotypic level what is happening, but it's difficult to, to say what's not uh, working. So we end up with some kind of uh, analyzing rather than improving the algorithm. So, and we know that, as we just saw, for example, specialization and some other kind of cooperation behavior, like cooperative hunting, is quite difficult to achieve. So what we have been doing recently in the last uh, three to four years is that we uh, took a step back and uh, actually tried to model, to find some uh, formal model of collective decision tasks, of uh, uh, cooperative tasks, and try to control the environment so that we can really pinpoint what's not working and how uh, we can really uh, solve this kind of problem. So uh, this is, in fact, what we did. So uh, in, this, uh, in this work that I'm going to, to present, um, what we do as a methodology is that we start from evolutionary game theory. In evolutionary game theory, you know that there are some very well-defined games 
We know that uh, we know the dynamics of these games. These, uh, these have been quite extensively uh, explored. So, um, and uh, in, they are highly used in modeling in biology, in evolutionary biology, of course. So, the, we take these games and then we look at the results. Of course, they sometimes not match, do not match with what we observe when we do the same within our simulation or with our real robots. And then we try to add simulation uh, of the coordination mechanism, that is the mechanistic aspects of interaction, of physical interaction between agents. And we try to see how much it changes actually the, uh, the games that, uh, that we are studying. So the stag ant is a um, quite famous model. So it's, uh, it's, it's the case where you've got two hunters and these two hunters have the choice to hunt either a hare, which is some kind of rabbit, or a stag, which is a larger animal where there could be danger if you try to hunt it alone. So the payoff matrix here says that if you try to hunt a hare, you are successful and you're going to get one point uh, as, a, as, a, as a result here. If you hunt a stag, well, if you're alone, you will just lose. Well, actually, if you hunt a stag, so if hunter one hunts a stag, he will get zero because it's too risky, because it's too dangerous, um, because the stag is too powerful or whatever. And the other one, well, we, we, we still uh, hunting the hare, he will, will still get one just as before. And, but if both hunt the stag, then you will get a, high, a higher reward. So this is quite different from the prisoner's dilemma because in this case, you've got two equilibrium. You, uh, don't, you should not deviate when you are both hunting the hare, because if you deviate, the other one will still have the same gain and not you. And you should not deviate if you are hunting the stag, because, okay, maybe it will cost something to the other, but the thing is that it will also cost something to you. So you have, you have this uh, uh, payoff dominant equilibrium, where you should stay, and this is risk dominant equilibrium, so these two Nash equilibrium, you should not uh, go away from, from these, uh, these, uh, uh, these equilibrium. As you saw, it's not a stag, it's a lion. So um, the thing is that when you take this numerical simulation, um, well, when you take, sorry, this game theoretical framework and you do num numerical simulation or analytical simulation, there is the effect of uh, gen genetic variability. That is because of, uh, of, well, it's called drift selection. That is when you've got uh, your gene, there is some probability that you will change the value of your gene. And of course, if you're alone, you will just go back to the previous, uh, to the previous uh, stage. And if you start with both hair and theirs, the thing is that, well, it will still act as an attractor. But of course, um, drift selection, when you've got only one gene defining the, uh, the ability to hunt either a hare or a stag, the probability that both individuals will mutate at the same time is quite high. And then, it, thanks to drift selection, actually, you will end up with uh, this kind of run. So these are numerical simulations where we have uh, 30 runs, I think. Yeah, 30 runs. Uh, when we have 30 runs where you converge toward everybody's ending the stack, that's a solved problem. You've got some uh, oscillation also because drift selection is not about converging to a, a stable state, but oscillating between several states. And you look at the frequency of the time you spent in, uh, in, uh, in each state, in each equilibrium, and uh, the pay of dominant equilibrium is the one that you stand the longest time. So that's great, but if you put it in simulation, so in the setup that we are interested in, if you introduce uh, physical interaction, uh, maybe things will change a little. So what we did for that, so uh, this, uh, this is the same evolutionary algorithm that I showed at the very beginning. This is control setup. We, uh, by doing this, actually, we forget about the mating problem. We remove the mating uh, uh, operator from the picture. We completely control the environment. We put two individuals, two robots, which have uh, sensory inputs, which can also sense the type of uh, the object they are seeing, if it's the other hunter, if it's a stag, if it's a, if it's a hare. So hare are green and stag are uh, violet, purple. And uh, we then define a payoff matrix, which is the same as before, except that we boost the, uh, the values so as to take uh, care, to, to take into account the fact that they also have to travel. So it's not just uh, one, uh, one and two. And we do some experiments. So I won't go into the details, but we, uh, we check that uh, uh, there are enough evaluations so that it's not just fitness noise. And we vary the number of prey uh, so that we, we know that it's not too particular. Um, so if you do this, the kind of results you, you get is, is this. Actually, uh, what we saw previously uh, just fails. It's not reproducible. You end up with these individuals. So I did not explain the figures. These are the number of generations. Uh, this is the percentage of successful stag hunting. 
And this is the, so for all the runs, the independent runs, we look at what they are uh, hunting. And so here, as you can see, well, they are all green, almost all green. So it means that uh, the, uh, all runs have the best individuals in the end, which are actually hunting uh, here. The, there is no, there is no uh, transition towards the hunting. And for all this experiment, we start with the worst case, that is we pre-optimize the behavior so that uh, all hunters are hair hunters, that is, they are in the uh, risk dominant uh, equilibrium. So it fails, it completely fails, and that's not a good thing, of course. And um, the thing that you could argue is that here it's a case of mutualist cooperation, that is, individuals are not related. What would happen, of course, if individuals would be related? That is, we know that if there is an inclusive fitness at work, you may uh, quite uh, easily evolve cooperation in this kind of case. So this is what we did. And it's not so great. So we take an extreme case of relatedness. It's completely artificial, of course. We take clones. So when, when, you, when you hunt, you hunt with a clone on yourself. There is no uh, pairing between uh, different kind of individual. And still in this case, it's not so uh, easy to evolve, uh, um, to evolve uh, cooperative hunting on the uh, greatest, uh, greatest prey. So you could say that if you let it learn, run longer, you've got some transition, but it really takes time. In the end, probably, they would, uh, they would all transition. We, did, we didn't uh, make the, we, we did some much longer run, but it really takes time. So we didn't converge all the runs to uh, stagnating. And in this case, what you can see is that, on the contrary, so the, the blue um, arrows are um, pointing the runs for which the stagnating, successful stagnating was more than uh, 50, uh, 50%. And what you can see is that um, there are actually hunting stags failing quite a lot of time and um, also, uh, well, more or less failing as, uh, as uh, often as they are succeeding uh, in hunting the, uh, the stag. Okay, and we did also something, but I will be very quick on this. We changed the payoff matrix to introduce like some kind of recycling pathway. So it's beneficial to hunt the hare when you are two because we wanted to force the evolution of hunting the hare just to see if the transition to the stag, which is now facilitated, uh, would, be, uh, would be easier to observe. And that's actually not really the case. Uh, it's uh, even worse than uh, with the cloning setup uh, shown previously. But what was interesting with this experiment, with the cloning one and this one, is that we actually got a glimpse of the uh, strategy that were used by the robots to uh, solve the task. And what, can, what you can see is this. So, of course, these are robots, not animals, but they are uh, first uh, wandering around, and once they found one another, they are turning uh, around one another in order to hunt the different uh, prey. And this turning is quite efficient, but also uh, lose a lot of time and energy, and sometimes fails, just as it just, uh, just failed now. And, uh, uh, but, but makes it possible to hunt, uh, to hunt the stag. So from this, there is a question, and this is the last question of my talk, is that, okay, why they do not uh, evolve some more complex behavior, especially when we have the recycling pathway? That is, uh, robots are supposedly different, and they may be able to take roles. Uh, and of course, maybe taking roles could be, uh, could be interesting. Maybe they could uh, be more efficient at hunting. So in order to do this, in order to explore this hypothesis, we did something which is very arbitrary, is that we try to complexify, to, to enable more complexity in terms of behavior. So theoretically, if you've got a neural network with enough uh, connection and nodes, you should be able to have a universal approximator and whatever, but in practice, when, you, when we did it, well, it was quite simple behavior that we, that we got. So even if it's theoretically possible, we, uh, forced to be, we forced the representation to be able to represent some things which could bifurcate between uh, two uh, uh, behaviors. So we added a new mutation operator, which is a duplication of, uh, operator, which is inspired, in fact, from gene duplication, where you just duplicate the same gene, and then you let both genes with the same function to uh, deviate. Well, of course, it's artificial, so no biological realism here. But uh, here we duplicate wool network. So the idea is that these, uh, one robot could uh, either have one, uh, one network or two robots, two network, and when they have two network, they can choose uh, when they are cooperating, when they are hunting together, to switch from one network to another. So in terms of genetic encoding, this means that you have now two networks which can be mutated and uh, diverge. 
you have this gene duplication, network duplication operator, which can create two network out of one, or when you've got two network, just uh, ablate one uh, of the two. So maximum, you have two networks. And during the lifetime uh, of the robots, during uh, evaluation, you have this choice, so we had also several strategies. You can choose among the different network uh, to assume some kind of different roles, to force uh, that different roles are possible. And uh, we did it, so a slightly different payoff matrix, but it's still the stack end. It retains the same uh, property as before. Uh, and what you, what you can see is that with this gene application, you have really a rise, very quick rise in the number of runs that end up with a successful cooperative hunting on the uh, larger prey. While this is the control, which was the previous experiment, which grows, but much, much slower. And actually, if you see at what they do, they do, and if you analyze the results, you see the following. You've got a very different strategy. You've got asymmetric, uh, asymmetric strategy. So gene duplica uh, network duplication makes it possible to break symmetry. And you've got a leader-follower uh, uh, strategy. So of course, in nature or with other robots in other environments, it might be different. But the one thing which is important in these results is not the fact that they are moving that way. It's the fact that it is asymmetrical and that there is a leader. Because if, if you look at the original payoff matrix, you had this, which was a coordination problem with two players. But when you have leader follower, you completely change the, the game. In fact, it's not a cooperative game anymore. It's a game with only one player because it is copied by the other. So if it switch from the uh, hair hunting to stag hunting, then it's just one switch. If the follower doesn't care about what it's hunting, it's just following the previous one. So this is about turning a cooperative game into an individual optimization game, so, and which is, of course, much simpler. So this is quite interesting because, of course, this was not captured by the original game theoretical setting. And this is something that actually can happen if you model the physical interaction between individuals. So it works robot, with robots. It might work with, uh, in nature, though I don't know, because I'm not, uh, uh, well, because I don't know. And, uh, and that's it. So, um, so that's, uh, that's it, so I'm going to conclude. Um, the only really important take-home message, and I knew I would be late, so I watched it in red. So um, I'm working with Swarm Robotics, and um, so what we think is that if Swarm Robotics is to be successful, well, we are in an unknown environment and we cannot predict anything. So we must also consider learning capabilities in this Swarm uh, Robotics. Of course, it's difficult because it must be online, because it must be distributed if we are to uh, achieve uh, optimization in the real world. And uh, and that's about it. I will finish by thanking the people who collaborated with me and uh, thanking the funding, which are important but less important than the people. Thank you.